Welcome to the Home Business Podcast with Richard Captain Henderson, publisher of Home Business Magazine, and Sherilyn Colleen, managing editor. This how-to show helps you successfully operate your home-based business. Greetings and welcome to the Home Business Podcast. I'm Richard Captain Henderson, your skipper at Home Business TV. Hey, I'm Lynn, your co-host. Let's gear for seeing, get it away. Millions of people throw their hat in the ring to become entrepreneurs, but many don't make it far. One entrepreneur, Joe Pippins, defied the odds and tragic situations to take his business to a whole new level with his innovative products, the Fishing Caddy. Joe Pippins has entered into partnerships with four major retailers to have the Fishing Caddy in stores around the country. Joe has an exciting story of overcoming hardships and challenges to get his product into highly competitive retail shelf spaces. So greetings, Joe Pippins. Welcome to the Home Business Podcast. Say hello to our audience. Hello, everyone. Glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming on our show. So you're calling in from the dynamic, cold, blistering hub of Kansas City? (laughs) Yes, yeah, we uh, got some uh, pretty winter-like weather right now. Not a lot of snow, but it's definitely cold. Yeah, I think the whole country is getting, uh, getting battered, but uh, the internet connection might be cold, but I think it's still intact, so thanks for uh, connecting in. Thank you. Thank you for Excited to learn your story. Well, let's get started. Let's learn a little about your story and entrepreneurial challenges. Joe, how did your life struggles lead you to where you are today? Um, just coming up as a kid, I've always been a, a long-time inventor. Um, solving problems and uh, uh, looking for ways to, to to fit needs. You know, from the time I was in high school and uh, elementary school, I actually uh, sold candy for a living when I needed to have funds for my lunch. Um, we so you were one of those entrepreneurs on the playground who was selling candy? <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. And I had my friends doing it with me as well. All That's right. Me. So born into it at an early age. Definitely. Yeah. We, uh, actually, my story kind of started with, with me being on punishment. Uh, my grandmother actually put me on punishment quite a few times and I, uh, actually sold my toys out of the window to get the things outside of the home that I needed. <laughs> so, anytime I need to grab the ice cream, man, I just basically flagged down one of my friends and traded a baseball card for it. <laughs> That's savvy. Well, naturally natural born entrepreneur. Um, well, you know, the fishing caddy, Joe, talk, talk to us a little bit about this innovative product that does compete in a demanding retail environment. Yeah, the fishing caddy is the answer to uh, what bank fishermen need and families need to get outdoors and, and enjoy it with everything being convenient. Um, typically, when you go outside and you want to go fishing, you, if everyone's ever been fishing, you got to carry a tackle box, your chair, your uh, rod holders, your stringer, and of course, your fishing bait and also your rod. So, you know, you'll probably spend probably more than 60% of your time fishing on setting up and transporting, transporting your products. So the fishing caddy takes all those items and consolidates onto a bucket. So it's got your rod holders. Uh, it's got a seat that you can sit on and store your tackle in and two waterproof LED lights and a detachable beverage holder all in one. Huh. So um, you're just an innovative guy and you see that uh, there's a demand for this product. And, you know, it's a huge market and people need a better way of staying organized than just a tackle box. Exactly. Yeah. And the fishing caddy does that very well because it not only just gives you a tackle, box but also gives you a place to put your rods as well and brings your rods closer to you so that you can sink the hook quicker um, but in the process of us uh, doing our focus groups we also noticed there's a great home and garden thing as well so for it's very good for all outdoors fishing hunting camping and of course home and garden i'm just curious how you know from the the, the time you initially thought about this till um you know when you developed a developed an actual prototype product how much how much time did that take that was about two years for me, uh, the concept to uh, prototype and actually made the first prototype out of Home Depot parts. And the first 300 fishing caddies were handmade out of Home Depot parts, everything from spray painting them to stitching the lids. Um, I actually hand cut every single decal as well. So it took a lot of time and care into building the first fishing caddies. You know, that's a really good point to bring out for somebody that does have a, some kind of a product they're trying to innovate. A lot of times people get lost um, trying to figure out how to actually manufacture that. But you you had some innovation there where you went to a large big box hardware store and, you know, and made do with what they had there and figured out how to put, you know, you already had the parts made up that way and that, that worked to get it launched. Yeah. Yeah, it sure did. And it was actually kind of helpful because I was able to determine the best way to make the fish and caddy as well. Initially. Um, we bought countless number of parts and different type, different, different sort of uh, uh, processes and techniques to, to get to where we're at today. Yeah, but it, it, you you saved a heck of a lot of money compared to going to like a a manufacturer that would have you know manufactured custom to what you wanted and all the trial and error 
that's a, you know, that's a really uh, good way to go about this. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, we did the home, we did the home, I guess you say the homemade prototype, uh, but then I did actually end up meeting with some consultants and an engineering group that did create some additional uh, attachments for us. And I guess I, you say uh, I paid my dues there, if you know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a whole segment of market out there for uh, companies that are looking for entrepreneurs to capitalize on their ideas and really overcharge them for their services. So I learned a, a hard lesson there. Mm -hmm. So Joe, what did you do to make your company and product stand out? Uh, well, the first thing I did is I went straight to the end user. You know, a lot of times when you build a product, you know, you think it's a great idea and uh, you kind of drink your own Kool-Aid, so to speak. Um, I did uh, several rounds of focus groups of fishermen and outdoorsmen, and uh, we actually had brought them all in and we showed them the fishing caddy and we asked them, uh, what do they like about it? What do they did not like about it? And then after that, I assembled a team of uh, fishermen all across the world, you know, guys as far as Brazil um, and uh, ice fishing in Minnesota and California. And I gave them a fishing caddy for free and just asked them for their feedback. So they helped us build this the product along the way. I mean, did you get some pretty good, I mean, meaningful feedback that allowed you to make some, you know, significant design changes or to just kind of help you improve the basic product that you'd already developed? Uh, a lot of that really came from just improving what we already had developed. Um, initially, when I was making the homemade version, I offered a 60 day money back guarantee because I wanted to hear from the end user if there was any problems. So we did have some manufacturing flaws early on. Um, and a normal uh, product, uh, you say innovator, would get upset, you know, and be, you know, kind of down and out if their product broke or it didn't work right. I actually saw that as a positive. So I was able to work out all the kinks before we go to mass. Hmm. Well, you know, big retailers are a huge challenge for smaller size businesses. Joe, what lessons, you know, would you have for other entrepreneurs who are trying to land that, you know, first account in a big retailer? Uh, first thing I would probably say is make sure that's really what you want. Um, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, people believe that inventors are instant millionaires and there's all this money and there's all this uh, yeah. glory, but <laughs> it's a lot of hard it's, roads. It's so far from the truth. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you can run into a situation I had, one of my partners that wrote me a PO and uh, I went out and made a bunch of significant investments to get the product here earlier so that we can meet that demand and then they changed their mind. So we ended up uh, losing quite a bit of money on that deal. So my advice would be follow with your business plan, regardless of who your partners are. Uh, well, I'm very, very thankful and grateful for my partners. Uh, that they did teach me a hard a lesson. Because as a small business, you don't have unlimited funds. Yeah, I guess you got to kind of be strategic and reckon. You know, you recognize where your limitations are being smaller. But you know, I, I've heard that before. Where with a big retailer, you know, what they consider a rounding error, like you know, canceling this purchase order, or delaying it, you know, that could have devastating financial impacts. Because um, that you know that could you could be looking at as half your half your sales. So you really you got to be careful. I guess you've got to take some risk if it looks like the purchase is there, but you got to, you know, have a grain of salt that they're, the, the bank accounts they're dealing with and you're dealing with as a startup could be really different. You just have to be careful. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be very, uh, not only just careful, but you also have to make sure that you got, uh, uh, that you have a team of people who are going to remind you of what this means when you do make this adjustment. How does it affect the other parts of your business? You know, in my case, I spent a significant amount of money shipping product to get it here earlier, only to find out that my launch was delayed. Um, had I put it in a different form of shipment, I would have basically saved about 75% of my cost. So the excess waste there could have paid my uh, labor expenses for probably about six months. So had I known what I know now, I will never make that, that mistake again. My partners will have to be flexible with me the same way I'm flexible with them. So it sounds like one of the big things you really had to keep an eye is you have to keep track of the expenses and be able to project the expenses, you know, and, and you know, and, and see where the extra costs are, the marginal costs of, you know, different alternatives and, and make sure you're not overextending yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Because every time you add an expense into there, whatever product you're selling now becomes more expensive. Right. So, you know, in my case, it was a significant shipping charge. So every one of those products that was on that shipment, uh, went up in, uh, you know, margins by about 2 or $3 a piece. So that's a pretty significant jump and uh, could have eventually made some of the products that I purchased not even profitable. So it's, it's a very, very wise thing to do is to watch the expenses. And I'm talking about even the $10 subscriptions to your, your favorite Apple stores. It's amazing how those things add up over time. Well, Joe, what are some things you wish that someone had told you about uh, business world and entrepreneurship before starting your business? Uh, first and foremost, I'd probably say budgeting. Um, you know, I think that, you know, there's a book that I love. It's by Damon Johns, one of my uh, guys I look up to the most. He has a book called The Power of Broke. And it talks a lot about 
you know, running your business as if you don't have any money. So even if you have it, be very, you know, make decisions as if you, 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 you don't. I um, love that. The power of broke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. By Damon John. He's, it's a, it's an excellent book. I highly recommend it. So um, that's interesting. I mean, I would not think, um, you know, asking you about, you know, school of hard knock, but it, you know, even though you're in, you know, design and innovation and that kind of thing, it came down to budgeting. Budgeting is where you had some uh, school of hard knocks then um, getting this launched. Absolutely. And it ended up being a situation where um, the, the budgeting part uh, could affected other parts of my business. Um, but, you know, most importantly, not just budgeting, you know, your overall expenses, but I'd probably even say budgeting your time, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> scheduling your time uh, and keeping track of those things. And it's always a good idea to have a, um, someone that's holding you accountable too, because sometimes you can just have a vision and you'll eat more than you should. Um, I would recommend starting small, uh, accomplish things in, in milestones and keystones and, and graduate when you meet those keystones. Don't do too many things at one time. I guess what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, niche part products like you have need referrals. Joe, what are, you know, who are some of your biggest fans and are you able to use social media at all, you know, to help uh, leverage this support and get your fishing caddy out there in, in greater distribution? Absolutely. Yeah, we got quite a few amount of uh, fishing caddy fans. Obviously with a product like ours, it's new to the sector that's very traditional. Um, fishing is very traditional and a lot of times people, uh, you know, kind of buck things that are new in certain segments and ours is definitely one of them. Um, but we have a lot of uh, people, uh, Mr. Rick Berry, uh, of the Ghost oh, of Warriors. Okay. Uh, he's a big fishing caddy fan. Uh, Warren Sapp, um, the Anthony Thomas, who plays for the Ravens now, but he played for the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, Catfish Cooley is another guy. He's uh, one of the comedians on, um, on YouTube. Uh, awesome. Right, yeah. He's made a couple of videos for us, too. And we have a ton of Facebook pages. And, you know, of course, our end users are our are, are biggest fans. Well, you have an advantage linking to social media yeah, because this is something people enjoy to do. Fishing, it's a hobby. And so that should, you know, that sounds, you know, that makes a natural fit to social media. And it sounds like, you know, you're actually um, able to use what are called influencers to help, uh, help push your product too. Yeah, yeah. We do use a lot of influencers as well. Instagram is a great place to start with that. Um, you'll be surprised the number of uh, influencers have a large following, um, how much they'll support you if you sometimes just do product swaps or uh, there might be a fee-based model that you might use with those guys. But that's a, that's a great place to, to get feedback, but also to get some sales as well. Great. Well, Joe, how would you advise other entrepreneurs to succeed in bringing their product to market? Uh, that's one thing I'm really passionate about. I think that the biggest thing is you got to find people that you trust. You know, when I first started this, this business, I can't tell you how many times I exchanged funds for services that were never rendered um, or individuals that overcharged. They, they really bank on your passion for your- you know, I want to bring that out a bit because I've heard that throughout the podcast. I mean, you had some, you had to be careful with some of the people you were dealing with. And, uh, you know, you, you, you just, you can't be too trusting, I guess, and, and hold people accountable um, or it could come back to bite you a little bit. Yeah, I think everything that you do with your business should be based off of results. Um, anybody that's a real professional that's looking after you to want to see you succeed should have no problem uh, producing the other results in exchange for any sort of monetary payment. Um, that's just something I learned early on. I didn't really think about that. You know, kind of like you were saying, I really trusted a lot of people and uh, we were still here and uh, we managed to learn a lot along the way. But I would say the main thing I would say for most entrepreneurs bringing their product to market is think about everything from how much is going to cost for your product to ship. Um, how much is the packaging? Uh, where are you going to manufacture? You know, are you going to manufacture here in the United States? Are you going to manufacture in China? With the recent political events, that can make a significant difference in whether or not it even makes sense to manufacture in China. Um, and in my case, the shipping and transit time was another big thing as well. So just kind of take a, take a pen to pad and really map out your, your, uh, your expenses and in your uh, processes uh, outside of uh, your passion for your product. Yeah, I really like the way you're presenting this. I mean, you you have like a big picture perspective, and I think that's important. I think sometimes too many entrepreneurs they go down a rabbit hole, and they don't see the totality of what they're dealing with. But you have a you have a good perspective, and you see you're seeing all the different elements and how they work together. Then you see where you know you need to put your actual focus in because something isn't going right. Exactly. And, and you got to bank for that too. You know, there's going to be plenty of, plenty of times when you're going to have a game plan. It's not going to go right. Um, I was just talking to my team today. I've got a team in North Carolina going to the Southern Christmas show in North Carolina. And uh, we talked about this, you know, we're going to have hiccups, you know, we're going to run into problems. We got to keep a positive attitude and realize that there was a day when I wished I was in this position. 
So good or bad, success or no success, what we've accomplished together as a team is, is, uh, has been done with positive energy. Just uh, positive incremental steps. Well, Joe Pippins, this has been a great discussion on your retail success with the fishing caddy. Do you have any final points you would like to share? Uh, well, you know, you can find the fishing caddy on Amazon, uh, Etsy, on thefishingcaddy.com. Um, you can also find it in our retail partners in Bass Pro and Cabela's, Shield Sporting Goods, and Ace Hardware as well. Um, so we want to build a product that brings families together while enjoying the outdoors, while not on electronics. And goes without saying, it makes a great Christmas gift. <laughs> sure does. It'll be the top, most unique Christmas gift you could possibly buy someone that loves the outdoors. Well, Joe Pippins, thank you for being such a wonderful guest on the Home Business Podcast. Thank you guys so much for having me. And uh, everyone, happy holidays and love on your loved ones and go fishing too. Go fishing. Go fishing. Right <laughs> Ice fishing. <laughs> Ice fishing, yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, to learn more about Joe Pippins and The Fishing Caddy, visit thefishingcaddy.com or our podcast website for more information on guests. Thanks for joining us in this episode of The Home Business Podcast. Share your feedback with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our website, homebusinessmag.com. Visit the website for information on advertising. Subscribe to our newsletter. Please visit our sponsors. For more information, visit homebusinessmag.com or the expo at homebusinessexpo.com. I'm Richard Capmenderson saying anchors away. We'll talk with you soon. Until then. Make it a great home-based biz day. Thank you.